I'm sure many of us have fallen into the trap of buying devices like this one, only to find out they don't really work. But don't throw it away just yet. We're going to talk about viewing CJ and EJ without having to buy an expensive monitor or particularly fancy equipment. Doing things on a bit of a budget here. Hello everyone, I'm High Treason, and uh, yeah, we're going to look at uh, getting CJ and EJ onto a VGA monitor. The uh, solution's quite simple. Install a VGA card. I'm High Treason, thanks for watching, and remember, don't be a screw-up, load DOS 622. Well, obviously not. Uh, great. Why do I feel like I've just sent at least 80% of the potential viewing audience for this away? Uh, I don't care. Whatever. But that point stands. Uh, using a VGA card is by far the simplest solution most of the time. For one thing, VGA cards are a lot easier to find because they were made for a much longer period of time. I think we almost take it for granted, really because it was the standard for such a long time that most cards and monitors will work with at least some version of it. Most VGA cards can even display CGA and EGA on a VGA monitor. They'll do the digital to analog and scan conversion for you, and most applications will have absolutely no idea that anything is wrong. Sometimes it's not as simple as that though. At the lower end of the problem scale, there are machines like my slower 286 that can't use most VGA cards. In this case, whilst the system does have 16-bit ISA slots, which was new to the 286, so Charlie systems don't like mixing 8 and 16-bit cards, and they don't tend to expect video cards that didn't exist yet to operate in ways that weren't established yet. This particular machine doesn't even know what VGA is, the buyers barely supports EGA, and its implementation of that is already a little bit dodgy on account of it being a brand new technology when this motherboard was produced. I mean, sure, you could buy clone machines like this, but... Well, they hadn't quite got the hang of cloning things yet. It, it isn't 100% IBM 5170 equivalent, it's 99.9 .9 recurring percent. Even older systems like XT's don't have 16-bit slots at all, and for those, you're entirely limited to 8-bit ISA VGA cards, which can be really hard to find and often cost quite a lot of money. Such old cards might lack several features. This Everex one of mine is among the very fast VGA clone cards it's from 1987, and whilst it does have CGA and EGA compatibility, it does this in ways that are a little bit strange compared to what you would be used to later on. It does generally work, but it's far from infallible. One notable feature about these older cards, though, is that they could even be set up to use monitors from CGA and EGA. But when using one with an analog VGA monitor, you'll still usually get digital to analog and scan rate conversion for those older modes. There are no SVGA resolutions, there's no acceleration, and the DAC is quite limited. And that's not just on clone cards, the original IBM VGA card from that year it was pretty much plain VGA, it didn't do a whole lot yet. You might be able to get some later 16-bit cards to work in old 8-bit slots. In fact, a lot of the earlier ones of that type will, but this isn't always practical either for various reasons. Although if they will, these cards are generally better, they tend to have more features and be more reliable. You'll be screwed if the card's bias uses any 386 instructions though, because it, it won't work on your ancient piece of crap. And yeah, I'm calling my system here an ancient piece of crap. I mean, just look at it. I love this system. The option to install a VGA card is pretty good, but what do you suppose we can do about this? Well, now you're screwed, aren't you? Sometimes you might be able to disable onboard video on a desktop, but almost never on a laptop, and whilst in both cases it's sometimes possible to install an ISA card, albeit you'd need an expansion box to do this on a laptop if it even has that feature. This option isn't usually available or it won't really work, and even on desktops you can't always disable the onboard video. So what's the deal? CGA was introduced alongside the original MDA for the IBM XT all the way back in 1981, so it is now 40 years old. Yeah, the, the naming's pretty simple. It's a color graphics adapter and a monochrome display adapter. 
uh, kind of, this monochrome card isn't actually an MDA because, well, those were quite limited and you might just have noticed the absence of the word graphics in its full name. As you might imagine, the problem was that CGA cost considerably more money and these machines were usually only used for business purposes anyway, so MDA cards were more common initially. The card you're seeing here probably outsold both over time and it was introduced a year later in 1982. It's not really an MDA. They're often labelled as such incorrectly, and it's not totally a false statement. This particular card is a Hercules graphics adapter, or at least it's a clone of one, so it's going to blow the monitor up or something according to Hercules. I, I guess they didn't like the clones. These were monochrome cards themselves. They would work with normal monochrome monitors, they could even display the same things as an original MDA but they offered some fairly high resolution graphics modes in grayscale, which is better than the MDA's pretty much just black and white. You could even display some CGA graphics modes through use of a TSR, and beyond that, it could even be made to work alongside other cards for multiple monitor setups. I know for a fact CAD designers and people in the uh, news media actually did this. It wasn't, wasn't unpopular in those industries to set things up that way. There was no reason not to, and it's it's a fairly capable card for its time. It has per pixel access, the MDA didn't. You have some geometric drawing capabilities. It's really a pretty neat piece of kit for what it is. I mean, while the original monochrome card was pretty much limited to 80 by 25 text mode with no means to display graphics whatsoever, the Hercules card offers 720 by 348 graphics. CGA actually could come close to this at 640x200, but this mode wasn't entirely practical most of the time, and it has some serious limitations with colours and such at, at higher resolutions. Usually the best you would see is 320x200, and oftentimes you'd get half this in a colour text mode. I mean, computers weren't that fast yet, so just being able to display the graphics is one thing, actually getting them to move around and do things on the screen is quite taxing, and, well, as noted, these are business machines, and I didn't really think that much about running video games on them when they designed these things. In modes that allowed it, generally the lower resolutions, you could have up to 16 colours on CGA, but oftentimes modes with only four colours were used. But this is all well and good. How do we look at pictures coming out of any of these cards? Well, unfortunately, the monochrome cards are a little bit more of a chore, and there's some technical issues, so we won't be getting those working today, but all three of these cards do output TTL video of some sort. This is a digital signal, and the simple answer is your VGA monitor is analog, so they're not the same. They inherently won't work with each other. However, your VGA monitor has several signal lines going to it. And don't let the 15-pin plug fool you, in fact, in some implementations it, it was 9-pin like the older cards. There are only really five signals that matter, those being red, green, and blue, as well as horizontal and vertical sync, which are separate here. There might be other things going on, like E did, but well, I guess we can forget about the... Uh, I don't think any of the hardware we've got here today has uh, any idea what things like that are, so yeah, that's kind of irrelevant. And E did is uh, what you plug-and-play monitors use to tell the computer what they're capable of. As it happens, CG outputs digital red, green and blue, and also has separate H and V sync pulses, but also has an intensity pin. It's essentially a 4-bit digital signal plus sync. In fact, in fact, I got a truth table for you here with uh, the colours. It turns out, in principle, making this work with an analogue screen probably isn't all that difficult. I advise against actually connecting these things to an analog monitor, if only because TTL's 5 volts, VGA's generally 0.7 volts, and you want to be really, really sure of the voltages, and your monitor probably isn't going to like the sync signals that come out of it anyway. But if you're feeling cheap and your screen actually supports it, you might be able to get a basic picture just by wiring it up to your monitor if it's good for 5 volts. If it doesn't want 5 volts, well, you can stuff some resistors in series with the signals and bring the voltage down. You could put a second set going to ground afterwards and make a voltage divider. It might make the maths a little bit easier. This is going to limit you to only 8 colours, though, and the odds are your monitor won't sync with it anyway. 
Generally, as VGA monitors, like around 31 kilohertz, and VGA is 15 kilohertz H-Sync. But if the monitor does support it, you will get a picture. Overall, what I'd recommend doing is connecting things to your Chinese converter, though, because you can use it backwards and get an unmolested signal by plugging your monitor into its input socket with the converter shut off. But you can also use it the right way and then protect your monitor from the voltages of these digital cards. Unfortunately, this won't actually work in this configuration, as you've probably witnessed if you've already bought one and tried to use it. Because this converter doesn't really like 15 kHz with separate sync, so you'll need to get composite sync. Luckily, this is really, really easy, and you won't have to rewire very much at all, because the adapter has a, a composite sync input and it uses the same pin as the horizontal sync, which makes it really easy to set up your circuit to switch between both methods with just a couple of switches. Now how do we get composite sync? An exclusive OR gate. It's a really simple thing to do and there are a few ways you can do it. Here's a truth table of what an exclusive OR gate does. It'll only turn on if only one of the inputs is, is high, it's only exclusively one or the other. This is quite literally all you have to do to get composite sync. You can actually separate composite sync again. Televisions do this, but amusingly the circuitry to do that is really quite complicated. <laughs> I'm not going to be going into that today. If you're feeling cheap, you could just use a capacitor as an exclusive OR gate. It's not the intended use for one, but capacitors only allow current to flow through them if there's a change in voltage. So, it will work as a really, really crappy exclusive OR gate until it wears out. The converter or a screen won't much like this, as you'll have some rather carved looking sync pulses now, and at best you'll get a really, really shitty, really, really shaky picture. But I thought it was worth mentioning, as people seem to have forgotten this method in recent times, and in some cases it's all you need. It's usually good enough for things that you're hooking up to televisions. If you're feeling creative, you could probably use a transistor-based exclusive OR gate. Maybe try to build one and see how few transistors you can use. But you may need to slap an inverter on the end too, which will use more transistors. Or a NOT gate might be a more appropriate term, which is going to use at least one more transistor. And the circuit I'm showing you here isn't really particularly reliable, and I've got no resistor values because you, you're going to have to adjust those par card, really, and it's, it's not going to work very well. You'd really want to build a better one, but to be honest, if we're going to go that far, we might as well just fuck it off entirely, because discrete versions of exclusive OR gates are cheaper than actually buying the individual parts, such as those in the 7.4 series, and all you have to do is supply 5 volts to it, which rather conveniently we can steal from this header on the China converter, so long as you are powering that with 5 volts, which I am doing from a USB port. Otherwise, I guess you'll have to stick a 7, 8, or 5 in there or something, but, well, you know, you figure these things out as you get there. Incidentally, if you're only going to use the CGA card with your China converter, you can actually get rid of all the resistors at this point. All you need is this exclusive OR gate, and the China converter will now work with the CGA card. It won't look fantastic, you'll be missing quite a few things, but you'll have a picture, and if you just want to use it for testing, you can basically just stop there and go no further. Worth noting is that some CGA cards actually have composite outputs. On mine, it's on a header, and you can hook these up to a television and skip basically everything that we've done here, because, well, you can just hook the card up to a TV. The capabilities of these outputs vary on some cards. They don't even function on certain cards, and I've never had a look connecting this to the composite sync input of the China converter. Although now I think about it, I think composite video for TVs is about 0.7 volts as well, and that maybe isn't enough. Maybe if we put an amplifier on it and brought it up to 5 volts, the China converter wouldn't mind, but then the China converter can do separate sync at 0.7, but I don't know. I mean, you can get away with this on TVs using composite video as a sync signal, so... Uh, maybe that needs more experimentation, but it's not going to change anything, so we'll just do things the way we're doing them. If you play with this and you get it to work, by all means, share your findings. Still, now you can switch the China converter into RGBS mode, and you should get a picture from the output. It'll look a bit crap, 
but still, if you just wanted a picture and to not risk blowing up a precious monitor, this will suffice. At this point, we can fuck the idea of hooking things up directly to the VGA monitor off. We're not ever going to go back there now. I don't really recommend doing it anyway, so yeah, we are just going to be using the China converter from this point forward. Now, as we only have three bits of the colour signal hooked up, we could do with connecting that intensity pin to something. Now, we could just run some extra resistors from it to the RGB pins, though your colour definition will be pretty piss poor doing it that way. It's enough if you just want to see if a colour should have the intensity bit applied, but it's not going to be very pretty. Now, we've come this far and you might still have no picture at all. Could be the dip switches on the card require adjustment. Now, I'll tell you what seems to be a little bit of a secret, and really shouldn't be, is that most CJ and EGA cards actually use the same dip switch layout as the original IBM ones, so you can always hook those up if there are none for your particular card available. It's not always the same, and if there are more switches, it's often shifted to the right or the left, but yeah, it's quite often the, the exact same setup as the IBM originals, and you can usually get it to work just by following those. Anyway, we want those 16 colours, and we need to scrap our shit little circuit and build another shitty little circuit. Or at least modify it. You should keep the exclusive OR gate though, we're always going to need that. There are a few ways we could go here. We could certainly build something really big, with lots of transistors all over it, and it would do a fantastic job, but that would cost time and money, and I'd kind of like just using diodes. To do this you'll ideally want signal diodes because they switch faster, but I've done this with power diodes and it works, the colours just bleed a bit and you get strange outlines on things, but you just it, it'll do the job. The diodes I ended up with still aren't really ideal, but this thing was made out of burnt out stereos and it cost a grand total of no pounds, so it was a win regardless. As you can see, the circuit is really quite simple, and it's certainly not a new invention. That There have been instances and variations of this going back at least 35 years that I'm aware of. But you will need four tweak pots for best results, otherwise you'll want somewhere between 330 and 1 kilo ohm resistors, and it won't be consistent between cards. You're just going to have to play with this until you can dial it in. Remember, you can run resistors in series and parallel with each other, so that might help you sort of get a feel for it. But it, tweak pots are quite cheap and easy to salvage from things, so if you can use those, use those, but you don't have to. Just expect it to be a bit dodgy if you plug a different card in, the, the colours won't be the same. Now when a colour is signalled, the voltage is lowered by the resistor that's in series with it to produce the darker colour, but if the intensity pin signals at the same time, it will pass through its own resistor, through the diodes, and to the relevant input pin on the China converter. Obviously this circuit is quite leaky, but once you've adjusted it, it should provide an acceptable picture most of the time. I mean, really, if we go back to the truth table, you're just mixing a dark grey with whatever colours displaying. It's, it's not fantastic. The colours won't be perfect. R really, the only way you're going to improve from here is to start making the circuit more complicated, and I don't really want to spend money on it. Unfortunately, one thing you're not going to get with such a simple circuit is brown. You'll notice that it looks a lot closer to morning piss yellow, and when you look at the signal pins that are on, it's actually correct, especially if we look at it as hexadecimal RGB values, or rough equivalents. What happens is the original IBM colour monitor has circuitry to make this colour brown. It essentially halves the intensity of the green when brown is displaying. I'm sure we could make a circuit to do it, but again, it's going to start using a far few transistors at that point, and I don't really want to do that. But while we're adjusting truth tables on the screen, these are kind of the colours you're going to actually end up with, with this circuit. They're, they're not perfect. Green especially does not really contrast well between its intense and not intense version. I'm sure you could add transistor logic and probably have voltage references on the board itself. that would be a little bit more reliable. And, you know, with transistor logic, you could certainly get things to look a lot better. But it'd really be against the point of what we're doing here. We're bin cheap, and we're cutting corners wherever we can. 
because spending money on things is shit, and I honestly take pride in these methods being slightly crap. It seems more defiant that way somehow. Of course, I'm fairly certain a particular other channel would not approve of the fact that I'm just skimming over brown, but, well, it, that's how we do things round here. Brown is a shit colour. Then again, so is yellow if you're having problems with digestion, so... Well, I guess my witty remark just went out the window, didn't it? Now, while we're still on the subject of these 16 colours, I should really point out that our truth table's kind of wrong, because... Uh, it, as far as I'm aware, the computer considers the intensity bit as the most significant bit, and... Well, this actually carries over, because... Well, if you were to represent them as a single digit, but, well, there you go, and... Yeah, you actually see that on the command line in, like, Windows XP with the colour command. Like, this is... I guess what it's referring to, or at least an equivalent of it. Also, yeah, VGA cards, they, they tend towards the brown as well, at least unless they've been programmed not to, so... Yeah, uh, colours actually do tend to be a bit funky with the CJ and EJ emulation or some really early cards. It's not quite the same. But nonetheless, I think that really does do it for displaying CJ. You should have an acceptable picture coming out of the China converter. Total cost, probably less than 30 quid. In fact, if you shop around, the China converter can be had for around half of this, and that's the only thing you can't build. All of the little components that we've had to assemble ourselves can be had for nothing if you take a walk down the street and rummage in your neighbour's garbage. Yeah, apparently this is uh, highly illegal in my country because uh, garbage is government property or something. I mean, they tell you to recycle, but then they prosecute you when you actually try to recycle things. It makes total sense. Yeah... I mean, it's, the, the neighbours didn't have a problem with it. The problem they had was that I was stood on their property, not that I was going through their trash. They didn't want it anymore. All jokes aside, this is a council estate, and there's an unwritten rule on council estates where if it's against the path, it's yours if you want it. Uh, like, seriously, no one will stop you just picking it up and walking off with it. If they put it there, they don't want it anymore. They'll be glad you've taken it. It's like, well, I don't got to get rid of that crap now. God knows what they want it for, but, well, there you go. It's gone. So, yeah. you don't got to pay for these things. It's just garbage. People throw electronics out all the time. Pick it up, take shit out of it, make something useful. Or, or mend it if it's something you want, you know. I'm sure we've all done it. So now, EJ, how do we make that work? Well, as luck would have it, EGA cards can be set up to work on CGA monitors. And this is something that would prove a bit of a double-edged sword. Uh, this will usually suffice if you run them in this mode. It's also worth noting that the Chinese converter will flat-out refuse to display some EGA modes, regardless of whether you switch your circuit into separate sync or composite sync, or how you connect and configure the card. In this compatibility mode, your EGA card will use the same signalling as CGA, but it will still be limited to only 16 colours, because there's only 4-bit colour still. But remember what I said about the CGA monitor thing? Well, by a ton of good fortune, EGA monitors are pretty rare for a reason. A lot of people just use them with CGA screens, and not many people even used EGA. It wasn't around for very long. It was about a two-year window for high-end machines to have come with it. I think probably as a result of this is most EGA applications never really seem to go beyond the 16 color modes, and, and being able to do this is certainly enough to get a computer started up and mess about in DOS and even run some games. So you probably won't really have to modify the circuit. Everything from here is completely optional and not very useful. See where CGA is 4-bit, EGA is 6-bit, and it has a total of 64 colours, though you can only display 16 of these at once, barring probably some third-party clone cards I think could display more. So, yeah, you probably would still get by without modifying the circuit, the colours just wouldn't be right, and they're not going to be. And you will forgive me for not making an EGA truth table, because it would take too long, and I don't think my tools have quite precise enough control over the colour. But you can find this information on the internet. There's plenty of examples of the 64-colour the EGA palette. 
Now, it was originally introduced late in 1984. It's the Enhanced Graphics Adapter is what EGA stands for. And, well, it offers a sizable improvement over the older technology. It's now at 640 by 350 maximum resolution. But this means you've got about 21 kilohertz uh, H-Sync, which the China Convata won't like. Predictably, it cost a lot of money, and it wasn't entirely popular, with Hercules cards likely still being the best sellers in this time. Notably, it would also have had only two years before VGA arrived, so high-end systems had only a really short time in which they might have come with an EGA card before people moved on. Or while CGA slowly began to displace Hercules as a budget solution, towards the end of the 80s, just before the cheaper, highly integrated VGA cards arrived around the start of the 90s. I mean, there are probably a hell of a lot more S3 Trios and Cirrus Logic 5400 series in the world than there are EGA cards. And probably more EGA cards than there are EGA monitors. In fact, I've even known of EGA cards being used with monochrome screens for their whole lives, so yeah. Good luck getting that a real monitor for one of these things. They're not really something you see very often. But I guess we're getting away on a tangent. Double-edged sword, mostly 16 colours, blah 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 blah. The, the, the correct way to do things here would be to build a really transistor-laden circuit with ands and ors and knots all over the place. But we can write that off because that wouldn't be in the spirit of things today where cutting corners and the number of transistors it would need would probably mean we'd actually have to spend money on them. And at a few pence per transistor, I'm not willing to do that. It's just unacceptable. It's too expensive. Diodes and resistors, though, we can totally get more of those out of blown up power supplies and stuff for absolutely nothing. That trash we stole from the neighbours. What you need to do is cut off the intensity line on your circuit here, which is to say put a jumper or a switch there so you can go back to CGA later. And to be honest, you'll have to do this whilst it's operating because EGA cards tend to use CGA signaling most of the time, regardless of how you've configured them. Also, it has its secondary green on what was CGA's intensity pin, hence we had to mess with the intensity part of our circuit. So, what are these secondary pins? Well, they're just intensity pins. Now you've got one per colour. Where CGA can only apply intensity to every colour that's currently displaying, or essentially just mix a dull grey with the existing colours to boost them, displaying EGA can apply it per colour. It's actually a little bit more complicated, but all we have to do now is put diodes on these secondary colour pins, add resistors in series, and hook them up to the output side, of your existing colour pins. Of course, by resistors, I mean you probably want tweak pots again. Unfortunately, you're only likely to get 32 colours at most, or at least that you'd be able to distinguish. But again, fuck spending money, and it's generally going to be enough that you can use this thing. Depending on your card and PC, the converter might refuse to work entirely, but if it doesn't, you should now actually have a, a picture from EGA, mostly, but again, some modes definitely won't work. Worth noting, the colours might actually look messed up in places, and a good place to look at this is in Commander Keen. And if that happens, all you need to do is change the clamp settings on the China Converter. It's in one of the menus, and yeah, there's not really much to say. Just adjust those. They're the only things you like. It's the cyan border in Keen will make the picture red. So if you get this, yeah, adjust the clamp settings. Just hold the button down on them until that goes away, and then just dial in the picture. Even then, the colours are going to be dodgy. It's going to be different for every card you plug in, and you'd think the voltage would be consistent. It's TTL, it's 5 volts that comes out of the card. You would think it would just be the host system's 5 volts, but then, as it's digital, would they have any reason to tune it if it was intolerance? VGA's analog signalling, the voltage controls the intensity of the colour, it has to be precise. On these, as long as it's within the tolerable range of what the system considers 5 volts, then I guess they'd have no need, so maybe that's why. Because really, the China converter is still not really doing any digital conversion as such. It, it's a digital device, but 
yeah, it, it's in tarpa in the input as an analog signal still, so yeah, it's it's not perfect. You will have to keep tweaking the circuit, and this is why I'd really recommend putting tweak pots on. And is our little device perfect? Well, not no. Does it produce a, the best picture? Hell no. Did it cost next to nothing? Well, absolutely, and so it wins. We could definitely do a lot better than this, but let's face it, if you're going to start spending money, you could buy a fancy converter, but again, they usually cost more than just getting a VGA card when it's for a PC. They're basically their own entire computer system, which I, I think is a little bit needless the extent some of them go to. They're probably not very efficient designs, and if you want to build something elaborate yourself, sure, go for it. On laptops you don't have the, the option of replacing a card, so maybe more appropriate if that's something you want to do a lot. But really you'd likely only use this device for testing, or else you wouldn't really need it to be that capable. Because the laptops aren't really... they're usually quite slow. Usually you'd only use this if, well, why is my screen not working, is it dead? You could certainly do a better job with the EGA side by making an entirely new circuit and using resistor ladders and uh, fancy transistor stuff. But uh, yeah, it's worth keeping in mind. I'd be interested to know if anybody did. I'd like to see the results. I'd be tempted to try it myself, but I just don't think I have the free time. For the for either card type, dialing in the colour intensity can take you a little while, but you do get a feel for it after you've done it with a couple of cards. So th does this device have a name? Well, I call mine the Video Bastardizer, because unlike those fancy ones, it doesn't really do a very nice job of converting the signals, it just bastardizes them and produces a fairly shitty approximation of what you want. But I'm really renting now. I think I'll... it covers it enough. I'll hand you back to that guy in front of the camera. So there we go, it's a, quite a simple solution. It does work, uh, within some reason. Um, yeah, you might be able to use this with other machines, because there are certainly other systems that output digital RGB in one way or another. You might be able to get away with using this on them, I can't see why not. Uh, it's, it's certainly not a circuit I invented. Like I said, this thing's been around forever. I, I have, like, a couple of old microelectronics books, like 70s, 80s. And there's even examples of this in there. There's loads of variations. Some have more components, some have less. Uh, it's been around basically for, forever, you know. It's not anything new. It's it's just a, a pull-up circuit, really. As I said, the intensity pin just pulls the voltage up. It's very simple. There's not that much complicated going on. You could possibly build a more elaborate version to fix the collars. Uh, I might have a go at it someday and see how... Oh, just, uh, yeah, well, maybe. I don't know. I don't know if I have the time. Uh, this thing works as well as I need it to. Now, what about those monochrome cards we talked about? Yeah, they, uh, you, you ain't likely to get those to work. You could totally hook them up to a single colour on this thing, but the China converter won't like them. You could convert them to composite, potentially, but... Your television probably won't like it. Interestingly, monochrome cards actually run at 50 hertz. I mean, I'm in a PAL country, so it, it, it won't work. I don't think they like the 18 kilohertz horizontal sync or something. The, the China converter certainly doesn't. And uh, EGA cards, while we're on composite, sometimes have composite jacks. There are a very small number of cards out there where these actually will work, but usually they don't, and you'd need this light pen daughter card before, the, or was it a memory expert, something, before there's even a chance of them working, even then they maybe still won't work. If your card has them, it probably isn't one of the handful where they do just work out of the box, but, well, there's no harm checking the voltage, you probably get zero volts, because there's probably nothing coming out of them, but there's no harm if it's not outputting something silly, and plugging it into your TV and seeing if it works, and, well, if it works, then you know if the output's working on the card, right? So that could save you a whole load of trouble. My, my CGA card has composite, but it's on a header. Uh, but it does work on that. Um, a lot of EGA cards, they don't even bother putting the jacks on. They just, you know, fuck, no one's going to use those. The, the one I've been using today, it doesn't have them. It's, I think there's headers for them, but... <laughs> yeah, that, that, it, it doesn't do anything, so... Yeah, like I say... It, it, 
the limits of this thing really are how far you want to go with it. It's, for the most part, I could really only see you using it for testing. Uh, if you want me to cover a more elaborate one, that might encourage me. Uh, there's certainly examples of them out there. I'd probably just look up someone else's circuit. I mean, you can look up uh, RGBI to analog RGB, and you'll just find countless variations of, of this circuit. Uh, you know, there's varying levels of complexity. It really does depend how far you want to go with it, but. Yeah, maybe if you want me to, I, I might consider building uh, one of the more complicated ones that, that fixes some of the problems with the, the colours. I mean, you know, the uh, the greys and whites and the browns and stuff, they're, they're not fantastic on this. Y you can sort of dial it in, but it's, it's always going to be a bit off. It's, this isn't the video I'd set out to do. I, I wanted to do one about Cyrix floating point units, of all things, but I've had problems testing them. It... Uh, it's sort of between 386 and 486 stuff, well, 387 and 487, and it did find some some peculiarities, but I, I couldn't really get good numbers because the VI9 board that takes both generations of these things is a bit of a troublesome board, and so I had to use another board to really do most of the 486 stuff, and it's actually really slow for some reason. I don't have any other board that's really appropriate for it out right now. Maybe we'll come back to it someday. Uh, probably won't be the next thing though. I, I don't, as always, don't know what next. I have another PC-104 machine that maybe we could look at. There's nothing to do with Cyrix. It's not an STPC this time, so... I've had it lying around for ages. I sort of mess with it occasionally. It doesn't come out very often, but... I'll probably find it. I, I think I know where I've left it. I usually... Usually not where it is, but occasionally it gets misplaced, and it's only tiny. So maybe we'll have a look at that, or maybe we'll do something completely different to that. I, I don't know. Uh, and admittedly, I've been slacking off a bit, because uh, I've been playing about with Dinosaur Planet. Because, I mean, that was like... I remember reading about it years ago, I was like, oh, that game looks fucking cool, I want to play that. And then it just vanished, never heard of it again. I didn't know it would become some Star Fox game, either. Which I, I did see that game, like, in passing, and I always thought it was weird, like, but this, yeah, this blue, uh, fiery fox character, she seems familiar, so it's not quite the same as what I think I'm remembering. And this doesn't look like a Star Fox game, I, I just buy a PlayStation 2 this generation, <laughs> but like, uh, yeah, yeah, there's a, a build of the N64 one leaked, so I've been, I've been messing with that, when I probably should be doing other things. And, and besides that, I've just not had much free time, and see how it goes. So yeah, I, I don't know. Um, we'll, we'll see what happens. But anyway, now now if you have one of those little Chinese video converters, you know how to actually make it fucking useful. It's, uh, it'll do the job. You, you can get a machine started up. If you have problems uh, putting the machine in, like, the, the card in the, the 40 column text mode, we'll usually at least get it to work. It's really depends on how the BIOS on the PC is implemented, it seems. Especially my older one has issues, regardless of the, the little converter and stuff. It, it does have problems with certain modes and stuff, and I, I just don't think they'd quite got the hang of it yet. It's certainly usable, but it's it has its flaws, you know. Well, it's 1985 technology. It's, uh, yeah, clones, you know, they cloning something that was brand new at that time and trying to make it cheap we've talked about before it, just, it was it kind of asking for trouble there were always going to be quarks involved but yeah simple little pull-up circuit I, I think I'm out of stuff to talk about if there's anything else we'll say after the thingy with the writing annoying synthesizers uh, so yeah I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna bail I'm High Treason, thanks for watching, and remember, until next time, don't be a scrub, load DOS 622 it.